Thank you very much. Um, so thank you uh, for the opportunity to, to introduce Covington and Burling and, and thank you to everyone who's here joining us today. Um, I am a, a partner based in our Washington DC office. Um, I'm in our office right now, so my home does not have a, a setup like this. <laughs> um, and I am in our in our food and drug group here in DC. And so what I'm going to first do is talk a bit about our US regulatory expertise and a bit more about the firm more broadly. And then I'm going to turn it over to my colleagues who have all joined today to talk about their various ex areas of expertise. We have um, partners in, in the food and drug practice who uh, are experts in both China and in EU issues. And then we have two partners from our corporate practice as well who, who work with companies um, you know, in various tech and in other spaces. And so um, I'm excited to give you all a bit more information about Covington. I'm gonna turn on a PowerPoint slide right now and I'm gonna go through a few of those slides, but not the entire deck. And we'll have that available at the end, I think to circulate. Um, and then we should have some, some good time at the end of this for Q&A as well. So I will launch um, that deck. Okay. Um, so just briefly, a, a bit of background about Covington. We really are and strive to be a global firm. Um, we have 13 offices, and, and those are located here, kind of as you can see, kind of across across the world. Um, but we also have an, an amazing network of, of lawyers who we work with closely in, in the countries where we don't have offices. And so we found that, particularly in the regulatory space, we've been able to provide really seamless advice to clients globally on, on kind of key and, and nuanced uh, questions or issues that might affect food companies or other companies in, in a regulated industry. And so we, we do that very well. We work together closely and, and we have um, great resources is to do that. I think it's particularly fun to do that on, on cutting edge issues like um, alternative proteins and other spaces like that where it's really um, cutting edge across the board and, and, and exciting in, in all of the jurisdictions where we're operating. Um, particularly in the US and the cultured alternative meat space, I'll just touch very briefly on this. Um, we, have, we have very good experience in this space from both the regulatory side and from a policy side. Um, I worked at the FDA, we have former chief counsels of FDA and, and former USDA lawyers as well. And so our experience includes both kind of focusing on the regulatory issues, but also, also thinking strategically about how to engage with regulators, when to engage with regulators, and the critical questions to be asking. And so we've been looking at this for finished product companies, for ingredient specific companies, and, and really for companies who haven't even entered the space yet, but are just thinking about it. Um, and, and on top of the, the regulatory issues, we also have a very strong policy team. And so again, in the US, there have been a lot of state issues related to naming conventions. There have been federal laws that have been considered on those same issues and we've been able to kind of navigate those successfully. More broadly, I'll just touch briefly on our, our global food practice and then I'm gonna turn it over to John to talk a bit about our China expertise. Um, so in, in addition to our food and drug practice, which is really what you consider a traditional food and drug practice, we have a food, what's called a food industry initiative. And the goal of that food industry initiative is really to to advise our food clients in all areas where they might seek advice. And so that's regulatory, that's also potentially corporate, that's litigation, um, and that's policy. And so we, we aim to provide comprehensive services and that's really what we seek to show you today is, is our expertise really across that space. Um, we have offices in, in US, Europe, UK, and China that all focus specifically in these areas. And then, like I said, a great network outside of that. Um, here's just an example of some of our representative clients really from a US perspective, but to give a good sense of, of the range of spaces where we operate. Um, you know, our, we represent trade associations, we represent individual companies, we represent large companies that are making ingredients and we represent investors as well. And so we have different perspectives that I think really bring a unique perspective to the table. Um, so that's a very, very high level of on the US side. We're, we're hoping for questions at the end to, to give you more insight into what you might wanna see, but I'm gonna turn this over to John right now uh, and he can talk a bit about our China expertise. Sure, 
Thank you. Um, thanks very much, Jessica. So my name is John Belzano. Uh, I'm currently sitting in the US um, for various reasons, but um, I would normally be going back and forth to our offices um, in Shanghai and Beijing. Um, I lead our, our China food drug and device regulatory uh, practice and I work very, very closely with the team, um, both in the United States. Um, we're one of the, the few firms where we really have, you know, China regulatory experts, both in the United States and then also in, in our, in our Shanghai and Beijing offices. Um, we are a, a regulatory focused group. Uh, in the sense that we span the life cycle of the products that we advise on. We advise on, as Jessica said, policy issues in China, talking about, you know, talking to companies about strategies for both short and long-term long advocacy on issues. Advocacy in China, mainland China, takes a, a very different um, form than it does in the United States or Europe. Um, and, um, and there are, there are certainly ways to do that and to accomplish goals. We sort of, and we work with our clients to achieve that. I've been doing, um, that work for, um, for about 16 years now, um, particularly on the, um, particularly on the, uh, the policy, the, the policy front, but we also advise on strategies to bring products to the market. We advise on, you know, the post-market environment in terms of safety reporting and also on, um, you know, handling, um, um, you know, recalls and other, and other safety incidents in China, and then on labeling and advertising and promotional issues as well. Um, so we're one of the, we're, you know, we're one of the firms that's very, very strong, um, in terms of really spanning the the life cycle of our of the products that we advise on and having experience in all of these different um all of these different areas in China. Most of us, you know, bring, most of us on my team bring a comparative uh, bent to that advertising. We under, excuse me, that advising. We understand China very, very well, but we also understand the surrounding markets, Hong Kong, uh, Taiwan, Macau, Japan, and other places we've done work throughout Asia. We bring that to our, to our advising on, on China. In terms of, in terms of um, this area of, 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 you know, alternative sources of food and, and, and particularly in, in the culture and meat area, you know, we have been, you know, we work with companies to sort of deal with, you know, a range of challenges when you bring a novel product to China. Finding, for example, the, the food standard that's going to support you when you bring the product onto the market. Every food needs to meet a food standard that comes onto the market in China. Choosing between, you know, imported manufacturing and domestic manufacturing. There are, there are you know, pros and cons and trade-offs to both of those options in China. And then thinking through not just you know, how to get the product to market fastest, but also to create a viable model for keeping the product on the market in terms of, you know, being able to advertise and promote it as you need to and meeting that model. And then also we have, we work, our regulatory team works very, very closely with our transactional team, our anti-corruption team to really develop strong and functional relationships with partners in China. Um, you know, it's very often advantageous to have a partner on the ground in China, even if you're bringing a product into the import channel um, but it's important to structure that relationship in the right way. And we truly work as a team in the China offices with myself and my team doing the regulatory parts of it. And then we have people who work on the transactional partnering and licensing side of, 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 of the advising. And then we have anti-corruption experts and, and government affairs experts in our, in our um, Shanghai and Beijing offices that also assist with that. So I'm going to turn over to my colleague, Bart Van Warren, who is in our Brussels office. I think he's actually, he maybe actually be in the office. I can tell from that background. Um, and um, I, I am not. <laughs> um, um, and thank you very much for having me. Thank you, John. I, I, I'm not in the office. It's past midnight here. So I'm speaking to you from uh, my home office and the entire family is already long asleep by now. Um, maybe so, so. I am a partner in, in the food and drug team based out of Covington's Brussels office. Um, our Brussels office, together with, with London and with Frankfurt, and with our presence also in Dublin, in Ireland, um, really, really functions as a hub, as a gateway um, to access um, the European continent for our clients. So we don't um, have offices in each uh, jurisdiction, in each country on the European continent, and we don't think that is actually necessary or cost efficient, but instead we have um, the whole array of lawyers that you would want uh, um, um, through through the, the offices in Brussels and London and Frankfurt. So we would um, assist clients with entering France and, and Italy and Spain and Germany, the Netherlands, Belgium, etc. cetera, through, through our um, 
three main offices um, in Europe. So we really function as, as a hub. Um, in, in the same way that we do in the US and China, and I think that's part of, of, of why Covington is, is so successful and good at what it does, we really have the full array of regulatory, commercial and policy um, offering in an integrated way through our food and drug practice in all those jurisdictions. So we quite easily navigate for our US or for our other clients. Um, th these very different markets and yet be very familiar with, with the different commercial objectives of our clients. Um, specifically in, in, in the cultured meat space, maybe some ongoing examples actually. Just this week, the European Parliament will vote on a potential ban on the, the, the naming of plant-based burgers or plant-based sausages. And that just shows that the plant-based meat industry as spearheading the alternative protein industry in Europe is meeting very significant vested interests, namely the, the, the very strong agricultural lobby in France and in Europe more generally. And for that, you really need a strong regulatory and public policy presence also because this will this is having an impact on clients ability to enter the market um, and in in the culture the meat sector this this will be no different because um, you will need an authorization to enter the european market um, consisting of 27 countries within the eu plus the uk and then also others such as norway etc and if, if not done well um, this can really stop the growth of this innovative industry, um, grind it to a halt and, and stop it in, in, in its tracks because there would be those same vested interests would no doubt try to block the, the novel food authorizations that are indispensable to enter this market. And so it's, it's really essential to um, very similar um, to how genetically modified organisms, GMOs, were stopped in their tracks already quite a while ago, to be very sensitive to the country-specific approaches to the, to the um, um, for instance, France and the UK and Spain aren't different, yet they depend on the same EU-wide rules. So it's, it's, it's very important to be sensitive to those differences, but also to um, the baseline at EU-wide level. And it's also not all bad. There is a lot of potential there. There is really the green deal, the green wave, the search for alternate proteins has definitely entered the European market. Um, surveys are showing that at least 30% of consumers would be willing to switch from a traditional meat-based protein diet to an alternative protein diet. So there is a lot of commercial potential in the European market but it's absolutely essential to enter it in a wise way to educate and to have this subtle approach, mixing the commercial with the public policy, with the regulatory. Um, and I, and I, I, I do think that we're very well equipped to um, assist you in, in entering the European market in that kind of subtle um, way. And, um, you know, I wouldn't stay up past midnight if I, if I, if I wouldn't be speaking the truth. So. On that note, over to Ingrid. Thanks, Bart. Uh, so I'm a partner in Covington, San Francisco office. It's well before midnight, so the, the sun is blaring in here. Um, and uh, thank you for having us. So I, I wanted to speak a little bit to our um, venture practice uh, at Covington. And again, kind of similar to some of the themes you've been hearing, we have lawyers globally, you know, both in California, New York, Washington, DC, London, China, Korea, and elsewhere in the world who work on emerging company and venture investment matters. And we have experience both representing, you know, the small company side, companies as they mature and grow and look toward an exit, and also the venture investors themselves and, and both financial investors and strategic investors and in particular, we represent a number of corporate venture investors, so global, global operating companies that are uh, looking to invest in startups and nurture these, these various ecosystems, including the cultured meat ecosystem. Um, so we have experience with the full range of financings from safes through preferred stock, through um, growth equity investments, IPOs, M&A, um, 
exits. Um, so really we can be with you from start to finish, including from the very early days of formation and, and, and first putting the company together. Um, we recognize these companies are in a space where you know the financing needs are intense, particularly when it comes to scaling up. So, you know, we're we're well equipped to help you consider, you know, how do you prepare your company for financing? What should you be thinking about? What will investors be thinking about? And then on the investor perspective, you know, what should you be looking at? What are the key diligence? issues, the value drivers for, for this particular company. And with the experts that you've already heard from, you can imagine that when it comes to diligence, you know, both reverse diligence on the company itself or diligence on a company you want to invest in, that we have, you know, amazing experts who can weigh in and, and identify risks and exposures in the business strategy very quickly and effectively. Um, and then, of course, and Nigel will speak to this more, but when it comes to your commercial partnerships or joint development agreements, joint ventures, you know, as, your, as the company develops, um, we can assist with that. And on the investor side, again, a, a lot of times when uh, one of our strategic uh, investor clients is making an investment, that, that might also be with the eye on a commercial relationship as well. And so we often partner side by side our commercial and corporate teams so that we can, you know, cover the whole the whole range of the transaction. And with that, I think I'll hand it over to Nigel. Thanks, Ingrid. Hello, everyone. My name is Nigel Howard. Uh, I'm based in our New York law office and I work in our commercial tra technology transactions uh, practice. Uh, so the deals I work on all focus on intellectual property, technology and data. We have about 50 lawyers firm-wide who work on this uh, type of work, and it covers every type of transaction an early stage company, uh, developing um, new innovative products and cultured meat would, would need, everything from ideation through to agile R&D, uh, production and licensing, uh, supply agreements, distribution and marketing, and importantly, I think for many of you, collaboration agreements, you'll, you'll be entering into collaboration agreements um, uh, to partner up on bringing your product to market. And that's exactly the kind of transaction that uh, we can help you with. Uh, it's a broad based practice um, <clears throat> in terms of the things that might be important to you. And why I think we, we do a really good job with the early stage companies we work with is one, we're fast and efficient, <clears throat> which is something that's obviously important to you as you move uh, quickly. Two, we, we know what the real issues are and what's really important to you. Uh, we won't fuss over the unimportant things. And we know the particular indus industry issues. <clears throat> and then thirdly, we work seamlessly with all the other lawyers in our law firm. And if, as you've heard from my colleagues, we have all these uh, great industry-specific knowledge uh, bases to tap into. And what's really great from a commercial lawyer's perspective is being able to tap into that knowledge and bring it to bear on the deals that you do as well. Um, and with that, I'm gonna conclude and hand back to Jessica so we can um, answer any questions. Jessica, you're still on mute. Sorry about that. I turned my video on. <laughs> I didn't do the other part. So I, I, there's two questions here that are kind of related that I'm going to answer a bit briefly and then maybe turn to Nigel or Ingrid if they want to address as well. And so one question is, what's the average scope of work for food tech startups and what stage do you typically work with Covington? And then kind of tied to that, are there startup options um, in terms of kind of working with us? And on the first question, I mean, I would say, you know, it ranges. And, and I would say, though, that we've worked with companies very, very early on from a regulatory perspective. And what we found, I think, for those companies is that it really adds value to show that they have the regulatory side of things nailed down and, and kind of in a sophisticated way at the outset. I mean, especially in this space, there are issues that, that are coming up right from the start in terms of manufacturing and engagement with regulators. And, and I think it's important to be thinking about those at the outset. Um, you know, so at least on the U.S. side, you know, companies do start very early on. I don't know if John or, or Bart have more to add. And then just high level, I'll say that, yes, we do have options available um, for, for startup companies in terms of 
of our fees and, and different options depending on financing and, and I, Nigel or, or Ingrid could weigh in on that too. I think John, John, do want, or John, do you want to add something first? I think you were. I, I would just say for for China, we, yes. I people, I think we do see great value when people start with a start with us from a very early stage, and that doesn't need to be a very substantial, you know, undertaking. But just sometimes a series of conversations that we have, you know, over a course of you know a, a couple of weeks or month, you know, just to get you familiar with the environment in China and to lay out the issues for you, and to also lay out the sort of cast of characters that you're going to need in terms of third parties and consultants and on the ground, you know, partners and agents. Um, 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 you know, to assist you with putting the product in motion. So, so I, I tend to think that you know, you know, we're very efficient in sort of doing it at an early stage, and 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 then learning the business. And I think once we learn the business, there, there's a lot of issues that we can spot for you down the road. Exactly. I think it's it's similar from a European perspective. So I, I mentioned that you would need an authorization to enter the market, which is something that you typically do with consultants who would, for instance, um, help you with, 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 with pulling together a safety studies and a dossier to get through the application. And um, we'd be involved early on in, in, in a relatively light touch approach in explaining to you perhaps, uh, helping you finding the right consultants can be one thing that you'd need because you would want um, and to these companies that are well versed in filing these applications, that know the people in the Food Safety Authority, that know who is whom in the national authorities. That's one thing. Another thing that we do is we would review the application to make sure that it's in line with your commercial objectives in the medium term. How will you label? How will you present your product? Um, there's also, when you file the application, there are some regulatory exclusivities that you may be able to benefit from. Will you at some point maybe want to file for a health claim? So we can early on already help you think in the medium term so that when you're still in the application process, you will um, have an easier time actually entering the market uh, once your application makes it through and once you actually launch your product. And I'll just add that one of the reasons why we represent companies from the early stages is the kind of bonds you, you build when you're a growing company that um, is the kind of bonds we want long term with our clients. We, we really invest um, in long term relationships with our clients and we find that even as Bart said, just a little bit of advice early on can really put you on the right direction. And then we just build up the relationship over time. So yeah, we, we're very keen on starting the relationship early on. Ingrid or Nigel, I don't know if you want to say any more just about kind of the options available for early stage companies in terms of. Pricing. I'll just say we, we, we do work regularly with startup companies and put together fee arrangements that make sense. You know, we really recognize that there may not be a lot of cash on hand, um, but also the importance of getting these things right early on. So. Yeah. yeah. One one thing we'll often do is we'll often attend board meetings um, for free, and the reason we do that is because not only can we give uh, legal guidance uh, at the board meeting, but also because we learn a lot from from working with early stage companies, and and frankly, it's some of the most fun work we do. Mm -hmm. And I think I would speak for all of us in saying that um, you know I think we're always willing to have a conversation. I get phone calls all the time that say you know someone says, well, I think. I'm too small to actually have you represent me. <laughs> and I say, I, I really don't think that's the case because you know it's never really too small, but I think at minimum, we're always happy to have a discussion about what, where we could add value and whether it even makes sense kind of at the stage your company's at. Um, I see one more that I'll, I'll try to answer briefly. I know we have just a few minutes and then maybe Bart could give like a like a 30 second answer on his side as well. And then I have one that I'm gonna to respond to in, in a written comment. But the question is what's their views on upcoming legislation for against cultured meat, is it promising? And I think I just wanted to say from a US perspective, I think it's been really impressive to see how regulators have worked um, to develop a framework absent some kind of statutory <laughs> directive that tells them to do so. I mean, certainly there was a need to do that, but I think FDA and USDA have both um, worked really hard to put in place something that makes sense um, and, and works for both agencies and, and I think is working towards implementing that as well. And so we've seen even in, in the past few days, 
FDA putting out a, a request for information on the naming of cultured seafood products, um, a request for an ANPR from U USDA. And so I think there's progress. I think the agencies see that there's a need for progress. And I think they really are trying to get it right in a way that makes sense for um, regulated entities. And so I think it's important to engage with them right now too, especially on new technologies or, or new ingredients. And I think now is the time to do that. Um, Bart, I don't know if you have any kind of closing thoughts on that from an EU perspective in terms of legislation, which I think there is more focused on naming than, than technology specifically, but... Um, mm -hmm. but currently the focus is definitely on naming and it isn't looking that promising right now actually, because as I mentioned, the traditional meat industry, the poultry, the pork industry is extraordinarily strong pushing back against and names that would allegedly confuse the consumers between real meat and alternative proteins. But on the technical side, um, there is a, the, the novel food regimes, the novel food rules have been renewed a couple of years ago. And that regulatory perspective, it is indeed important to engage early. And you will find a technical level much more willingness because it's outside, outside of the political spotlight. So engaging early will actually help you to, to get to market in, in a relatively smooth way. So there is the political level, which is an issue, but you will still be able to enter the market. And there's the technical, where I don't think we're, as, we're not as advanced as the FDA. So early engagement is, is essential. I don't know about that. <laughs> Okay, I know we're we're about a minute before our time, and so I'm happy to turn it over to the folks at CMS if that works. But I think I'll speak for all of us in saying that we're always happy, you know, to, to chat um, or connect if you want to reach out, and, and we'll work to get our full presentation deck uploaded just so that you all have information available to you. Um, I appreciate the time. I think we all do. Thank you all. Yes, thanks so much. Thank you.